guys, this is Veramaso. We are in beautiful Cabo San Lucas. We got a lot to cover over the next few days, so we're gonna go ahead and get into it. Welcome to Cabo San Lucas. I've never been out on a paddleboard, but today's gonna be the day to do it, and I've got the man to teach me. This is Gunther with Cabo SUP. I made it out, I made it back, and as you can see, I'm still dry. If you haven't paddle boarded, it's one of the most enjoyable, relaxing things to do. If you have done it, but you haven't done it in Cabo, I will tell you this, waking up and going out in the sunrise to see the arch is one of the most beautiful experiences I've had in a while. You guys, we got a lot more to cover, so from here, on to the next stop. Here we go. So we just got off the paddle board seeing El Arco from the water. Now we're gonna go see the Bay of Cabo San Lucas from a different view. It's about a 45 minute hike, absolutely beautiful view of Cabo. We just got done with a hike. We went over and had an amazing breakfast at Sir Beach House. Now, we're where it all started. The most famous neighborhood, one of the oldest neighborhoods in all of Los Cabos, Pedregal. I remember 24 years old and I got a call. Your old man, he just passed away. And you've got to get down here because there's business to be taken care of. And I thought I was going home. And then I was told there's more business to be done and there's no one to do it except you. This right here was my first deal on my own. Was able to buy the government uh, land which was offered up in an auction. Uh, this was a very publicly known, um, highly scrutinized deal because it's a massive piece of land that hadn't been touched for years. You know, getting thrown into it in that type of situation, it's like you don't even have time to think about it. It's just, you're in it, and it's just, what's the next thing to do? Nevertheless, we bought the land, we were able to sell it, and successfully put the first deal on my own in the books. Now, we continue with the real estate through Baja Investment Group, Leisure Trust, and soon working with Leisure School to educate others on how to do some of the stuff that I've learned over the past 10 years. Another piece of Cabo, this is it, guys. Just got a call from one of my best friends, Dan Cash. We're gonna go over to his place at Hacienda Beach Club and Villas and uh, see what they've got going on. Enjoy a little bit of the afternoon with them. So when we talk about vacationing and vacationing in amazing places, this is what I'm talking about. This place is called Hacienda Beach Club and Residences, okay? Now, what we do with Leisure Trust is we learn how to work the system and stay in places like this for cheaper than a Motel 8. So what you're about to see is one of my best boy's houses. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. I'm gonna go in, have some fun with them. You're gonna see the place, and then we're on to the next spot. One of the things that you've got to know about Cabo is the nightlife. Actually, this is where things began for me. My first nightclub, my first restaurant, right here. We're gonna walk past and check them out. And if you come to Cabo, if you're not here tonight, three places you're gonna check out. One will be your fit. One, Nowhere Bar, owned by my boy Pablo. Gotta check it out. Another one, Mandala. It's your spot if you really like to dance. And the last one, the famous Squid Row. Been around for years. 
it's an amazing spot to get a real, real Cabo style crazy party. This right here is the Sunday morning brunch. They have the pelo de perro. It's the famous Bloody Mary that they make here. So today, we're gonna learn about how to make the pelo de perro. The idea here is that we're taking all of the fresh ingredients that everything is made here on site or everything is grown here on site. Okay, now I know why it's famous. <laughs> We are with the man behind the magic here, the executive chef, Guillermo Tellez. Guillermo, introduce yourself. Hello, welcome to uh, Florida Farms. My name is uh, Guillermo Tellez, and uh, well, we just want to welcome you and give you a quick overview of uh, the little things that we do here. Most of the stuff that we're raising here, we make everything from scratch. From growing our vegetables to making our own cheese and uh, making our own charcuterie. Amazing. Very simple, very old world, but it works. We built everything here as far as like this. So what I'm going to show you now is, is, is something that is uh, it's very unique here, uh, especially here in Moscato. We have like uh, like beautiful um, Serrano ham style cured legs that are like over four years old. So that's what's behind this door. That's what's behind the door. Come on in. Come on in, guys. Aging really well. 18, 10, 17. So this right here has been curing since October 18th of 2017. Yep. <laughs> Unbelievable. We've had an amazing experience learning how to make Bloody Marys. We've been able to walk through the farm, see everything that they've been able to create here. We had an amazing meal. Guys, this is all about learning, creating, giving. It's been a wonderful experience. We're at one of my favorite places in Los Cabos. This right here is Acre Restaurant and Hotel. I'm here with Brittany. She is one of the faces in charge. We're gonna learn a little bit about Acre. Brittany's gonna tell us what's going on here. Yeah, so welcome to Acre. We are a 25 acre property, all organic farmland. Uh, Acre was actually just a uh, organic mango farm four and a half years ago. And now we've got our restaurant, we have tree houses, we have villas, pool, event space. So sort of a big work in progress. Mango farm to this. Yes. All uh, right, you heard it. Let's go see <laughs> all of this. So now we are with Jordan at the Mezcal Bar. Jordan's gonna explain a little bit about the brand, how they got from the beginning to now. So give us a little insights on what's going on here. Yeah, so for starters, my, uh, my business partner and I were just fascinated about Mezcal and we were trying a whole bunch of different Mezcals, learning more about it. And then we decided to take a trip to Oaxaca to explore the land and we we're kind of thinking about, hey, maybe we should bottle this and find, you know, create something on our own. So, um, so, so Oaxaca, that is like home of Mezcal? Yes, Oaxaca, okay. Oaxaca is the home, it's the heartland of Mezcal. And we go and the next thing I know, we're on the bumpiest road you've ever seen, driving three hours to this remote little village called uh, Santa Ana del Rio. Okay. And that's where we met our producer, uh, Honorado Cruz, who makes uh, three of the Mezcals that we have right here. And once we tried it, we just knew like this is, this is the one for us. 
and you know we can we you know it's something that should be bottled and something that we should take home and and kind of here we are what is involved in creating mezcal so mezcal so mezcal is anything that's distilled from agave okay so the big difference is between mezcal and tequila so tequila is distilled only from blue agave okay where mezcal is distilled from any kind of agave okay so each of the four of these are made from a different kind of agave plant Okay. And basically what they do is they, uh, they wait until the, the agave reaches its maturity, which depending on the plant can be anywhere from 7 to 25, 30 years. Okay. They, uh, a long thing called a coyote will grow out of the top of it. and uh, That's the thing that comes yes, out. Okay, got it. That's the, got that's it, got the, got the got sprout got that comes okay. out of the top. So they, they, cut that, they cut the coyote off. That allows all the sugar to rush back down into the middle of the plant. They let that sit for about six months in that state and then they'll cut off all the leaves and harvest uh, the center of the plant called the pina. Ah. And then from there they'll dig, uh, they dig a deep hole in the ground, maybe eight feet deep, 15 feet wide, fill it with hot rocks, start a fire. And they take the pinas and they put it on those rocks and cover it in dirt. Okay. And they roast it in the ground for four to five days. So that's where you get all the smokiness from a mezcal is through that process of that roasting in the ground. Like it is, it's very, uh, it's very authentic very very organic they haven't changed a thing that they do in 100 years so in short it is done over a three week period for fermentation yes and then how long from that point does it take to get it into the bottle uh the distillation process to distill it twice will take no more than a few days usually okay. and at that point it's ready to be bottled okay it's ready and to go just so for a novice like myself to get understanding of distillation mm -hmm. after it's fermented what does that look like it looks like, so it's over an open flame. They, uh, they take that mash of the agave fiber and the water, which is now kind of turned soupy and, and somewhat alcoholic. Okay. And the fire evaporates the alcohol vapors. So you have the alcohol vapors rising, and then you've got cool water flowing from the top that'll make the vapors condensate again. Okay. And then it's just alcohol that will drip back down into a little container and flow off. And then so that that's, goes, how, that's how they extract the alcohol. And then that goes and in there. Goes straight in here. So Jordan's taught us how to make mezcal, what they're doing with it. Now it's available online to be purchased in the U.S. AcreMezcal.com. I got to say thank you to Jordan for having us out. The owners, Stuart, Cam, Brittany, for showing us around. This place is amazing. You guys go check out the Mezcal online. And if you're ever in Cabo, come down, check out Acre. Jordan, thank you so much for bringing us. This Pleasure has been amazing. I'm so excited to share this with you. After years of working through the timeshare industry, learning how to sell, learning how to use them, going through Leisure Trust to teach so many people how to leverage the timeshares to be able to vacation like this, and now it's full circle. My first project, developing a timeshare down here in Los Cabos. Everybody's gonna be able to have this view and enjoy it. Hey, it's Barrett. We are at the world famous Wild Canyon in Los Cabos, Mexico. If you're into wild activities like ATVs, bungee jumping, zip lining, this is the place to come to. We've got a private host today that's gonna take us in. We don't know what we're getting ourselves into, but we know that it's gonna be an adventure. Let's go on inside, meet the host, and see what's gonna happen. Gene is the man when it comes to getting things done around here. Gene, tell us a little bit about the history of Wild Canyon and uh, what we're going to be doing today. Well, I'm going to take you for, uh, for an amazing ride today. We're going to be doing some different activities for your show. It's going to be great. And I'm just going to recommend you to hold on tight. Thanks to Gene and Wild Canyon for the opportunity. This has been an amazing experience. Thank you. I'm Barrett Masso, here to help you get to where you want to go.
I, even going back, man, you know what I when we were in LA about this. You were the first one I got the approval. But going down, I'm like, bro, I think I'm looking at having a new business name. When I had your blessing, man, I'm like, this is, I knew that for you to bless that name and the logo, I knew we got something. And that's how it started. Things, man, you don't know how much it means to me, man. You know what I mean? How much I get even emotional, man. Just, it's just the beginning. No, just man. the beginning, baby. No, man. I appreciate you for, for really, you know. It's crazy, man. It's deep, I swear to God, man. I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't be here, man. No, I shouldn't. All I ask, I have a lot of family members, man. Glory without a father. You know, people like you, man, who put me in this situation that I'm, I'm helping others, man, you know? And it's crazy. And I, I'm like, man, you made me believe in myself, you know, and all, a lot of the things that's coming, you know? And uh, I know now I'm like, man, where are we heading? Because just people are hitting us left and right. We're at the world famous Montage Resort in Los Cabos. My sister, the owner, the founder, the designer, Eclectic Array. We're gonna learn a little bit about what she has going on here. Tell us the story, tell us what's going on here. Absolutely, so at Eclectic Array, our mission is to give fair trade sustainable opportunities to artisans and designers in Mexico, to give them opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have. But the thing for me that was so heartwarming was to see the love that they put into every single piece. So tell a little bit about how I played a role yeah. and give me some credit. <laughs> the manufacturing side can be um, a blessing and a curse. So I'm forever grateful to have you um, really taking the lead on so many of the projects. Good morning. We are in Leon, Guanajuato, Mexico. We made it. We are standing outside of the factory that manufactures the Barrett Masso luxury duffel bags and travel accessories. We're gonna go inside. We're gonna meet the people behind making these bags. We're also gonna find out how are these bags made. So let's go inside, meet the people, learn how it's done. Guys, I want you to meet Sara E. Sara E is one of the most important people when it comes to making everything happen here. She's gonna take us inside. We're gonna learn a little bit about what's going on with the brand right now, and we're gonna learn how to make the bags. Let's go inside. Que paso? Who's the verte? All right, guys. You need to meet this. You need to meet this guy. Uriel, he is responsible for everything that happens here. Well, los dos. But Uriel's gonna take us around today. He's gonna show us the process of how the bags are made. Okay, so what he's telling me is that right now, the first thing that they do when they receive the leather from the factory is they come in and lay out pieces. They check where there's any imperfections and they note that. Once they find those, they cut them out. So once we get into the cutting, they make sure that all of the stuff that we're cutting has the highest quality, there are no imperfections. So they're laying out the molds to where they can cut each part of the bag um, as the second part of the process. Bueno. This is actually doing the cutting of the leather by machine. So we did cutting by hand over there. That's larger pieces. That right there doesn't require the precision of these small items. You can see that this right here is a mold for some of the other items that are on the bag. If they were trying to do this type of precision one by one, it would take them forever. 
and the precision likely wouldn't be as strong as when they're doing it by machine. Third part of the process is where we're actually calibrating the leather. So they will go to the millimeter. They're putting the leather in. They're making sure that the thickness of each part is always the exact same for every item that we're making. Okay, so this part of the process, this right here is if we needed to fold any of the cuts, this right here allows us to do that. Also, it allows us to line up exactly where the stitching needs to be. So this will take this through the machine, and in the end, you're gonna see the impressions where it shows where it needs to be folded or sewn. So what they're doing is they're actually putting glue down on the individual pieces where they're going to be joining the bags together. So this machine right here that he's using, this is the Trokel. So when you see those really fancy logos that are impressed into leather or other fabrics, this is the type of machine that does it. It's using air pressure to come down with a steel kind of mold goes into the leather and that's how you get that really nice um, impression in the fabric. Depending on the leather, you have to have a certain amount of time, you have to have a certain pressure, and you have to have a certain hold. If you're not doing that right there, the consistency, the quality is not gonna be there. We have a different machine for each, depending on what leather is being sewn, depending on what piece is being sewn, but this right here is one of them where we're actually going in and we're sewing the piece um, to then either be joined with another piece or being finished at this. Se limpia completamente y se procede al empaque. That's the process. So once the bag's made, we're cleaning it, we're putting the accessories in there, then it's being packaged so it can be shipped. You guys just learned from beginning to end how the Barrett Masso bags and accessories are made. We've learned, we've created, and thanks to Uriel and Sara E, you guys have been able to be a part of this experience. So we just finished up seeing the bags. Now we're gonna go inside and see a new little part of the Barrett Masso brand. We're actually making shoes. So those right there, that's what you're gonna get a glimpse of on the inside. Let's go inside, meet Sergio, and learn how the shoes are made. All right, so tell me what's happening here. Okay, this is the lasting process. Okay. What we do here, we steam up the, all of the uppers okay. to, soften, to soften all of the fibers, and then they got the upper, they compare it with the last, okay. and then the robot comes in and takes the shape of the toe, and all of the operators stretch it out okay. to copy the shape of the of a human feet. At this time, we are lasting all of the sides of the upper into the last in order to avoid every wrinkle and to copy the body of the last per se. After it is done, it will go to be heated up again in this electrical resistance. Okay, in this part, um, the shoe will be heated up in the back side because we want to have a softer heel counter and then it will go to the machine to pre-shape the, the, the backside. You will see that all of the backside will be lasted. It will be lasted with a 10 ton pressure on the backside. Fulfill all of the spaces that are inside the shoe. We are in the chlorine process. We will clean up all of the TPR and rubber outsoles. Where every spot you see a purple light, it means that it is covered with blue to ensure 100% of the cementing process. So in this part, they will line up um, the superior edge of the outsole in order to, to, set, to have the limit for the glue to be set in. Here, the process is a sandpaper process where we take all of the upper finishes on the leather out in order to find the fibers of the leather where the cement will be applied. Here with a moto tool, it's a very, very fine skiving in the upper edge in order to have a really clear line for applying the glue. Here we are applying the glue. It has to cover 100% of the sky leather in order to have a 100% accuracy. After the shoe is applied with glue, it has to be radiated with 
UV rays, uh, 100 Celsius degrees steam air, and it will be there for around like four minutes in order to activate all of the molecules for the glue in between the upper and the outsole. They will get the outsole into the upper with the last, and then they will come into this condom pressure machine to seal up the shoe. Here we just put the pair of shoes into a freezing oven to stabilize all of the fibers of the shoes. Thank you. So after the freezing process, it is set for applying the midsole, fill it with paper, lace it up, clean it, and then wrap it and ship it to you. There you've heard it. We've learned, we've created, and thanks to Sergio and his team, we've had this amazing experience. Okay, so now we're at Futura. Futura is where they manufacture the leather that goes into making the Barrett Mosso bags and the Barrett Mosso shoes. We're gonna walk around the factory. We're gonna see how the actual leather is made. Let's go. So the first part of the process when the cueto or when the animal skin, the raw hides, arrives to the factory, it's to remove the hair. In order to do that, they put it in these giant, what they refer to as tamboras, these large drums. The wet blue, that actually removes the hair from the hives. Where they'll put it through a machine to, imagine squeezing a sponge or a wet cloth, it's taking, wringing out all the liquid. They then put it on the tables and they review it to make sure they're removing any of the leathers that have defects, any stretching, any things that aren't gonna be usable for a finished product. They then stick it back into the tambores or the drums. So now they're actually putting a liquid on it that's going to make it smooth or it's gonna give it some type of uh, roughness or texture, priming it for coloring. Last part of the process, they're actually putting it into the machines where they're gonna be painted, they're going to be polished, they're going to be giving an added texture. So we're wrapping up our time here at Futura. We've learned how to make the leather that goes into creating the Barrett Mosso bags and Barrett Mosso shoes. Now we're going to be heading to the factory to learn how the Barrett Mosso clothing line is made. Let's go. This is the last stop in Mexico. Going right into this door, this is where the Barrett Mosso V-necks and polos were made. We're going to go inside, we're going to meet the people responsible for making them, and you're going to learn how they're made. Let's go on in. So we're inside San Miguel, the factory where everything began. This right here, Pepe Vasquez, the man who put up with me for six months making the first product. Um, Pepe is going to take us through the factory and he's going to show us how everything is made. We're designing electronically how the shirt is, the size, all the details. After they did the electronic designs, they actually print out kind of stencils or markers. They then put those over the shirts on this table, and then they use the hand cutting to cut each piece of the shirt prior to then moving over to have it sewn. We then put it on this machine. This machine right here, through heat, is going to print the tag with the name, the size, any of the details that are being stamped on the shirt. Here we're taking the individual pieces and we are sewing them together to be what is the finished product, the shirt. We're wrapping up our time here in San Miguel with Pepe at the factory where all of the clothing is made. We've learned, we've created, and thanks to Pepe and his team, we've been given the opportunity to have an amazing experience. I'm Barrett Masso. I look forward to helping you get to where you want to go. So one of the things that I love doing um, when I'm not traveling is giving vacations. Uh, so right now we're giving away a couple vacations for Christmas.
when I found out about the family, uh, it, it just crushed me because you're talking about a couple who sees vacationers every day of their life. And they've never ever had a vacation. Think about that. Barrett, mucho gusto. Mucho gusto, Juan. ¿Cómo estás? Bien, ¿estás? Sí, muy bien, muy bien. Uh -huh. Tú puedes ordenar cual cosa que quieres y disfrutar como esta es tu casa, ¿me entiendes? Bueno, agradecemos todo lo que ustedes hacen porque sin ustedes Nada de este va a pasar. ¿eh? ¿Estamos claro? Sí. Bueno, bueno. Bueno, um, I just let him know, you know, he, he. Without people like them, this wouldn't be possible. The families that are out here enjoying vacation, they wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for them. Um, the locals here were so adamant on trying to help them because they're so deserving. They've made this possible, so now they need to know that they deserve this more than anyone. And this week, nothing is at their cost. They enjoy everything that they'd like and make this their home for the next week. And they know that they're 100% clear with that and they're gonna enjoy it to their fullest. All right, so we're here at Bodega right now. We're waiting to meet the family. We're gonna take the family in. We're gonna buy some groceries. We're gonna buy some bathing suits because they don't have bathing suits. After that, we're gonna head over to Hacienda Cantada. We're gonna get them checked in, get them settled, and then enjoy their vacation. They're here. Here we go, guys. Nunca, nunca fuiste en una vacación. So, the, 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 the first vacation ever. They're super excited about everything, and uh, we're going to get them registered so they can get on their vacation and enjoy the week. Walmart. We are going to pick up some gifts for the boys and girls here in Los Cabos. We're going to the poorest neighborhoods in Cabo. So to be able to go out there and uh, spread the love and give a little Christmas to the community, it's gonna be beautiful. So let's uh, buy some presents. We don't have near enough toys. Uh, so all of that right there, we're just gonna take all of it. Feliz Navidad! ¿Cómo te llamas? Santa
Santa hair out of my teeth is Invasiones. That is the poorest neighborhood in Los Cabos. We're gonna go there, give all these presents, and uh, make a lot of children happy, and hopefully get out of there alive because they're gonna be super excited and it's gonna get crazy. <laughs> Let's do this. What kind of goes through your mind, man, you know, when you're seeing these kids, seeing the homes, seeing the moms, like, what just kind of comes to mind, or in, in that moment, what do you feel? Oh, man. Uh, probably gratitude the first, you know? Uh, gratitude on so many levels. Gratitude having the ability to give, uh, being in the position that I'm in. Uh, gratitude for my life, for everything that I have, uh, first and foremost. In half a mile, turn left onto Avenida Reforma. Um, That's good. Job. And, and, you know, <clears throat> it's crazy how we, we take everything for granted. We think that we're always going to have, you know, the things that we have, or we get upset about the little things that come our way during the day. And, you know, it trips you out to hear this, but some of the people that cross us tonight, those aren't people that have always been poor. Some of those people have had jobs and had homes and, you know, through circumstance, lost everything. And so I think that after seeing some of those families um, in different states, uh, living in a very different life and then living there, It'll put things in check, you know, like, remember, you've got it today, but it could all be gone tomorrow. You know, the more that we, the more get, we come together to give, the, you know, the greater impact we can have. So, you know, we went in and, what, rung up about $1,000 worth of gifts. Can you imagine if everybody went out and bought one Barbie for three bucks or, you know, one Play-Doh for $3? They send that stuff in. I mean, think about how many lives we could impact or how cheap is a Santa suit? How great would it be if we could get Santa's people to go and get their Santa suits and dress up and we're spreading a world of Santa's going out and giving these so every kid out there sees Santa. Amazing time in Cabo. One issue, Santa wasn't able to give away all the gifts. But I think I've got an idea. Thanks so much for watching the episode. If you enjoyed what you saw in this one, stay tuned because you're gonna love what's coming up next.